multidisciplinary artist and I use analogue photography, video, mask making and performance in my practice to explore themes around my dual heritage. I also look at kind of matrilineal mythologies, so stories passed down from my grandma and kind of aspects of Nepali and Caribbean folklore, which I explore through mask making. I usually get really consumed in the research period of making and um, I kind of sometimes feel sad when in the outcome people can't really kind of access the research and access that kind of process of learning that making anything is and I think that's such an important thing for me because making something is also about how you're transformed by that knowledge and I think making anything is like a process of transfiguration. And I think research, when it's made transparent, can best help to reflect that. Adding a face was made in my last year of uni. It wasn't my final project, um, but it was definitely the first foray into video performance I had. Up until then, because I was studying BA photography, I had usually only worked with like still images like developed in the dark room. And so adding a face was really um, becoming sort of a multidisciplinary artist and also allowing myself the freedom to respond to the themes and what came up in an organic way. It was actually made during lockdown. And so I didn't have access to the dark room. And so I kind of had to change how I would normally work. And I'm really glad that I had to because that definitely was the first of a kind of ongoing way of responding to things that I didn't have in my vocabulary before. Before that I maybe wasn't, I wasn't incorporating so much about my own identity in my work as kind of explicitly. I, it was still to do with kind of themes of family and femininity but um, I think adding a face was actually moving away from coming at things from a from an outside angle and really coming from my own positionality. Obviously, I've grown up with my Nepali side of the family. And so I've grown up with my grandma, with all of the masks that she's made around me and lots of kind of photos of past exhibitions and stories told by her of different kind of creatures and different folklore beings. And I think I kind of really remember that very vividly. So I've kind of always had a sense of it. But going there to do the two month residency with Space A really gave me a kind of understanding of Nepali culture. And um, also kind of I started to understand more the nuances of certain celebrations, also how they're kind of uh, also political in their own sense. And um, also understanding that, you know, my grandma made this last called the Lake and the Lake dance in Nepal wouldn't be wouldn't be allowed to be performed by a woman. So actually kind of reframing my grandma's work and say, looking at it like, oh, she wouldn't actually be traditionally allowed to engage with this part of the culture. And so also understanding how I've kind of experienced a kind of diasporic kind of iteration of that culture too. I think folklore imaginary is sort of, um, another iteration of that is intergenerational but it's becoming more and more diluted in a sense because I was born in London I'm not when I go to Nepal I'm not going there as a necessarily like kind of a native I'm going there as someone who's diasporic and who is extracting different things from it in a certain in a certain way it was a chance to actually learn some practical techniques in terms of mask making and also to um, have my own connection with the place, which I think is really important. It was a really enriching experience. It was very open. There wasn't too much pressure. But one thing I was kind of surprised about is there's a very different shift in kind of people and how people are. The culture of people is quite kind of, people are quite shy there, obviously because we're, we're Westerners when we go there. It's like we're treated very differently. Also, there's like almost no black people in Nepal. So they're not used to seeing someone with curly hair, you know, and of my skin tone. Being dual heritage, I really felt that. And um, people, some people were really, really shocked to hear that I have Nepali family and that I'm, I'm half Nepali. It was interesting and it was kind of also realising how much of my kind of core character is informed from growing up in London. Yeah, seeing the villages is where like some of the culture is preserved the most.
in the cities are actually kind of becoming very very hyper modern i think it's quite a slow process but they're obviously looking to places like india that are looking to places like america it's also like the tradition and the culture has become a sort of tourist attraction they bring those things out when the tourist is there and so we went trekking off season and so during season there's usually these traditional dancers and dancers from the Gurung tribe which is um, the like lineage that I connect to. We went, we went and saw some Gurung villages but they only really do the dances anymore in, in season. Living in London my whole life it's, it's been very easy to maybe have also a romanticised image of Nepal and what it's like and so it's also realising how places change and whilst you may be interested in the kind of indig indigenous culture, maybe that's not necessarily practiced in the same way that it was, say, 20, 30 years ago. I think folklore imaginary at its root is, was really inspired by the Larke dance and this figure of the Larke who's said to protect townspeople and children and has this really fearsome appearance, it's red traditionally with um, kind of these big fangs and skulls and um, my grandma has made a mask of this and it was in our home and so when I came into her care at age four it really scared me at first but it ended up being kind of what I see as an entry point to learning about that side of my heritage and um, whilst I'm not actually I'm not actually responding to the, the original cultural kind of representation of it I think I'm I'm more kind of responding to its personal significance for me and um, that's why when I made Protector of the Children I was not wanting to remake the Larke and to do the Larke dance but I was sort of taking inspiration from that and on the mask I use yak tail which is something that's used a lot in different religious festivals and is seen as kind of a sacred object so I wanted to kind of refer to that but not recreate it completely um, and so that's one of the kind of mythologies that inform folklore imaginary. So for Effigy for a Black Soldier I kind of definitely knew I wanted there to be some sort of song and I definitely felt that due to the themes of kind of looking at um, my dad who was in the British Army I definitely wanted it to be sort of like an English folk song. And so I kind of settled on Wayfaring Stranger, which is some, one that I've really loved for a long time. I wanted it to be a non-traditional rendering of that. And I wanted it to be quite atmospheric. So I was also thinking about how it would feel in the space. Buster Woodruff Bryant, who plays saxophone, is my partner and who I collaborate with a lot. And so it was kind of like a no-brainer to kind of involve him. I think for an audiovisual piece, it's very important for there to be space. It's not the same as creating a, a song per se. It's also like meant to be like a sonic experience. And I thought of Syl, who's an incredible electronic music artist. She built her own motion controlled MIDI instrument. So it's an instrument that has sensors and that she can control with her hands and with programming. And she also sings. It was, it was, it just really fit kind of having someone who could sing but could also do electronics to kind of help create this ambient atmosphere. In the bright light, in the bright light, to which you go. word avatar to me is very much linked to my dual identity. It's a very useful word because it kind of shows the plurality that's in everyone. It's kind of shown through my face casts that are the one in Folklore Imaginary is double-sided and the, what I love about working with face casts is that when they're in the light they kind of they really change and this reminds me of Japanese Hanya masks that change at different kind of intervals and um, I think that they're, they're the face of a woman they're meant to kind of look fearsome from some angles and kind of sad from others and they're used in theatre. And so I think this idea of the avatar is also something that's very linked to performance and multiplicity. And I think that's a very useful kind of framework to use when thinking about heritage and when thinking about kind of transcultural identity specifically. 
The tin types were created during a workshop with Almudena Romero, who's an art photographer and artist who works primarily with analog printing processes that are quite difficult and quite technical. I brought these two objects, so this Nepali mask that I have in my home and this head of an African woman. That's a wood sculpture. And we took photographs of them on large, a large format camera. From those negatives, we like transferred that onto pieces of tin. Large format photography is like a really, it's an old process. And they were used to kind of document archival objects, like museum objects, people. That format of photography definitely has a lot of historical references. And I, that's why I felt like it was a perfect way to um, capture these old objects and kind of situate them properly. I'm always thinking of different ways to approach kind of printing photographs. Regarding the screen print, so one of the masks is a picture I took of this mask that my grandma made that's a water spirit and it hangs in our living room and this is one of the masks that is her own sort of creation so it's not actually coming directly from a particular folklore figure but um, it came to her in meditation and um, I feel like the outcome really reminds me of some sort of African textiles. Um, the, that, that, those specific colours and the way they sort of overlap. The title Carnival of Masks is also alluding to Notting Hill Carnival, which is something that I've grown up going to and dancing in. And it's a diasporic sort of carnival. It's not, it's not a kind of um, undiluted Caribbean carnival. And it's, it was, its purpose was to promote sort of, sort of like this racial harmony and cohesion in that area. It's been so great to be able to build a connection with Hull. It's been great to screen print. It's been great to work with such a kind of closely knit team who all have really supported me in producing the work, but also giving me the space to kind of imagine. And it's been really nice to see my artwork situated in a space, which I really haven't because I graduated during COVID. So I've never really had the opportunity to make work thinking with a certain space in mind. And I think that definitely influenced the outcome of the works and made them more ambitious in their scope.